Hi everybody, Dr. Deed Harrison here from Chiropractic Biophysics Seminars and Technique and Chiropractic Biophysics Nonprofit, our research organization. This week I'm going to go through another really, really exciting paper, hot off the press, uh, just as actually online uh, this month at the European Journal of Physical Rehabilitation and Medicine. This is a brand new randomized trial and this is the pre-press release on the journal's website. So uh, the lead author is my uh, good friend and colleague from Cairo, Egypt at uh, Cairo University, uh, Ibrahim Mustafa, a professor there. Uh, his colleague, Aliyah Diab, professor there as well. And then myself, uh, Deed, uh, Deed Harrison. The title of the paper is The Effect of Normalizing the Sagittal Cervical Configuration on Dizziness, specifically cervicogenic dizziness, neck pain and cervicocephalic kinesthetic sensibility. What that means is repositioning sense of the head and neck in space. This is a one year randomized control study. Uh, this came out uh, in or actually is online at the European Journal of Physical Medicine Rehabilitation 2016. Here's the link uh, to the abstract and then they actually allow you for free to download the provisional PDF of the accepted version. Now this is not the typeset and true edited version as it will appear in print in the journal. However, this is the accepted version and many journals do this now. They do a pre-release of it as the accepted form so authors can share it uh, with research communities. Uh, this particular project is a, a brand new breakthrough study, like I said, on cervical genic dizziness. Now here's the deal. Cervical genic dizziness is quite common in the population. It creates a lot of psychosocial distress and it's associated with a lot of healthcare expenses. There, there's really good evidence for short-term effects of, of many interventions. However, the long-term effects of most things conservatively and with medication is really not that well investigated or it's really lacking in true evidence at one year follow-up, right? So this is the big deal. People that have chronic cervicogenic dizziness, they, they don't have a lot of hope in many cases. So continuing to investigate subgroups or specific populations with this condition and trying to identify proper intervention strategies is actually mandatory. Okay, so first and foremost, just to give you a little bit of a background, uh, this particular paper came out on uh, cervicogenic dizziness in 2008. It's from Manual Therapy. Uh, this is a randomized trial looking at the ability of the SNAG technique, which is, you know, I'll show you a picture, but it's basically mobilization of the cervical spine, primarily in the sagittal plane, but also using some offset uh, oblique vector uh, directed forces. And what this attempts to do is increase the range of motion at specific cervical joints in flexion and extension or rotation. So this was done by Reed et al. 2008. And I just want to show you uh, DHI is an important outcome assessment for cervicogenic dizziness. The DHI is called the Dizziness Handicap uh, in Inventory. It's a validated questionnaire for different types of dizziness. And this uh, randomized trial used the DHI as a primary outcome uh, tool to investigate a placebo group that was uh, compared against a, a treated snag group, and I'll show you what the snag is. I just want to show you these scores. We're in the mid-40s, maybe in the 50s for the DHI, which is moderate chronic disability on the DHI. And this is pre-treatment, and then look at post-treatment. It drops down to almost, almost 40 to 50 percent improved in the snag group. And then, of course, the placebo group sees a weak, statistically significant decrease in the DHI, but it's certainly not as great as the treatment group. And then this is a six week and 12 week follow up. So we've got care and then we've stopped care and then we see six week and 12 week follow up. So a three month follow up. And you can see in this study, the DHI scores uh, two things. Number one, for three months, they remained consistently improved. Uh, number two, we're seeing about a 45 to 50% improvement in the DHI. These people still have disability. They still have dizziness. However, they are improved. However, if I'm a patient with cervicogenic dizziness, I look at this and I go, well, hey, I still got problems. I'm still, you know, 30% or more in my DHI, right? And then here's the frequency of dizziness graphed on the same uh, 
type of uh, you know scale pre-treatment post-treatment six week follow-up after no care and then 12 week three month follow-up and you can see the frequency of dizziness is improved as well in the actual snag group so uh, also pain scores sorry I forgot this was going to pop up the pain scores show a similar uh, uh, type of graph in terms of the visual analog uh, pain neck pain score now this is the snag technique so what you can do is you can either get on unilateral zygopophyseal uh, joints and you can load it with a band of interest in CBP technique. We use what's called a prolordotic neck exerciser. Here they're using this small band to isolate you know, one to two segments in the cervical spine, bend backwards and then load forward theoretically at the angle of the individual cervical zygopophyseal joint or manual mobilization techniques can be used with your thumb. You can apply pressure P to A slightly oblique and you get on a unilateral zygopophyseal facet joint in the cervical spine, you mobilize it forward. So you load to tension and then unload, load and then unload. And then this is showing a bilateral technique. Okay, so this is the concept of the SNEG, specifically in this uh, article here, uh, th this would be the more what you would call sophisticated method. This would be the manual therapy intervention method. Uh, just to just, just show you the improvements in the, the dizziness and the DHI uh, here in a separate trial from 2014, uh, this shows you know, similar ideas. The DHI is what I want to focus on. So in the snag group baseline, that means starting the study, and then post-treatment drops down to 32, and then at 12-week follow-up, it's 30. And then here, the manual uh, mobilization technique, yeah, that's the, the therapist doing it without the uh, uh, little band, so by hand, appears to be better. However, the subject started with a higher DHI. Uh, this is showing about a 50% improvement in the DHI uh, over time uh, compared to a statistically but not as great of a reduction in the placebo group. Uh, my point by showing you these numbers with the DHI is there are statistically significant improvements in the DHI score by doing manual mobilization techniques and other things for cervicogenic dizziness. However, when you review all the literature, what you find is roughly a 30 to 50 percent improvement in the cervicogenic dizziness as measured with the DHI or other types of scales. What that means is the patient is still left with 50% disability, okay? So the three-month follow-ups are pretty consistent in the literature and they go, yeah, see three-month follow-up, but what happens after three months? Does the dizziness go back to baseline values? Are they still 30 to 50% improved? And then what do we do about the remaining 30 to 50% of the dizziness handicap inventory scale. The person is still in chronic cervicogenic dizziness. You can't just stop and say, oh, that's great. We did care and now you're done. The person goes, hey, I still have 50% left. Hey, you know what? I feel better, but I still have a problem, right? That's my point with the, this little review. So that leads into our new trial, looking at two things. Can we identify a better method of improving sub, a subgroup of people with cervicogenic dizziness? And are those results going to be maintained at one year follow-up? So here's our hypothesis. Our hypothesis is this. There is a subgroup of patients with cervicogenic dizziness that have a loss of the cervical curvature or they have a reversal of the cervical curvature and they have anterior head translation. There is a subgroup of those people. If we rehabilitate that cervical curve and that head posture, our hypothesis is there should be statistically significant improvements in cervicogenic dizziness scales, outcome measures, in the subgroup that we rehabilitate the cervical curve and head posture with compared to a group that we do standard intervention and we don't rehabilitate the cervical curve, right? This is our primary hypothesis. We're looking at we're going to do consistent methods that are available in the literature. We're going to see a group of people, how they respond to that. We're going to look at 10-week outcomes, and then we're going to look at one-year follow-up. Then we're going to compare them to a group that we do the same standard known intervention, but we'll add the cervical spine denerol as the 
independent variable, variable between the two groups or the studied variable. So it's the experimental group that gets this general and we're going to see are the short-term and long-term outcomes different. Number one, can the dental improve the cervical curve? Well, we've already seen in previous studies that it can, but we need to find out in this population, does it work? And then we want to find out, are there any differences right after care, after 10 weeks? And then are there long-term differences at one year follow-up? So here's our study. Randomized controlled study with a one year follow-up done at Cairo University by our great colleagues, uh, Professor Mustafa and uh, Professor Diab. Uh, we did 72 subjects, 25 female, 47 males, uh, with chronic cervicogenic dizziness. These subjects were 40 to 55 years of age. Now, previously, we did a pilot project where we previously determined the sample size. So we already know that we need at least 30 subjects to have a significance level of 5% and a statistical power of 80%. To account for possible dropouts, we took that number 30 and we increased it by 20%. In other words, we put six more subjects in each group, hoping that at one year follow-up, we would, we would maintain a minimum of 30 subjects at one year follow-up because that's what we need for proper statistical power anal analysis. We also, you'll see the statistics, we looked at what do we need as a minimally clinically important difference on the DHI. So we have enough subjects to, to know, did we achieve a true minimally clinically important difference on the dizziness handicap inventory? Now, maybe some of you don't know what that means, but others out there, the researchers in the audience, you'll know what that means. That's a very important part of this project. This is not a pilot project. Uh, previous studies that we've done were pilot projects, but this is not. This is a full-scale RCT looking at a proper sample size with proper uh, power analysis to see can we achieve differences that are statistically and clinically significant. So here's our inclusion criteria. You had to have a cervical curve less than 25 degrees as measured from C2 to C7. This curve is very, very you know, well below uh, 25 degrees. It's way below it. So we look at the back of the body of C2 and the back of the body of C7. If you're less than 25 degrees, you can be in the study. We'll see how much curve the average subject actually had. You had to have anterior head translation more than 15 millimeters to be in the study. And then you had to have recurrent episodes of dizziness lasting longer than three months. Uh, dizziness had to also be provoked by certain movements and positions of the head and neck. Uh, dizziness had to be described as imbalance or steadiness, not what we call rotatory vertigo, which is really driven theoretically by the inner ear, by the vestibular apparatus. It's not that the inner ear doesn't play a role in cervicogenic dizziness. We're just trying to select out the primary issues of vestibular apparatus problems and say, hey, it's not really driven by abnormalities of the cerv cervical spine. Also, to be in this study, you had to have a painful and stiff neck. Okay, exclusion criteria, there was many of them. Uh, this type of neck would not be excluded. This is a kyphotic neck that would be in our project. It's certainly less than 25 degrees and as long as the head translation was more than 15 millimeters, it would be in there. However, anybody with that, uh, any history of stroke, uh, diagnosis of any bleeding disorder, uh, currently taking anticoagulation treatment, uh, presence of inflammatory joint, joint diseases like uh, rheumatoid arthritis, etc., uh, infection, tumor, fracture of the spine, all excluded. Okay? Also, if you're taking uh, narcotic drugs. So here's our, our study. Uh, we screened 100 patients that potentially fulfilled our criteria. 72 of them, 72%, were found to be eligible, 28 not eligible. And this is just important to go through and, and look at from a study point of view. You go, why did some subjects not meet the criteria? Uh, some of them had problems that we had to exclude. And then, of course, there's you know 9% that said, hey, I don't want to be in this study. Uh, then 72 of the subjects were randomized into an experimental group that gets the standard interventions plus the Denerol. The Denerol is the experimental group and then a control group that only gets the standard intervention. 36 subjects in each group. Then we treat them for 10 weeks, three times a week for 10 weeks. 30 visits, both groups get that. We stop care, except they're allowed to do some minor home care. Stop care after the 10 weeks of treatment or 30 visits, stop. They don't come in and get any more care in the university. 
right? And then we follow them for a year. So we have a true one year follow up after termination of care. Okay, so we look at how many did we lose? Five, left with 31, lost six, left with 30, happy day. I have a minimum of 30 subjects to do proper statistical analysis. And then patient demographics, and you can look this all up in the paper, which is why I'm going through it. It's online, again, at the website uh, for the European Journal of Physical Rehabilitation and Medicine. So we're just looking at have we matched these subjects appropriately for all the proper variables, and the answer is yes. Okay, now, let's look here at the anterior head translation. The average subject with cervicogenic dizziness in the dental group had 35 millimeters, 3.5 centimeters of anterior head translation. The control group that didn't get the dental, 32 millimeters, 3.2 centimeters. They are statistically identical within three millimeters. And that's con considerable anterior head translation, roughly almost an inch and a half. And then look at their ARA, the cervical curve. 25 degrees was our cut point. These subjects are well below that. They're seven and a half, 7.2 degrees for their cervical curve, right? And then their VAS. VAS is the visual analog scale for how severe the dizziness is. Seven is severe dizziness. Pain is moderate chronic pain. And then look at the DHI scores, high 40s, consistent with the previous papers. This is where they start. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. Both groups get this intervention in red, both groups. Okay, both groups get hot packs and tens directed to the cervical spine. Why? That can help control some pain, help with blood flow, it can help uh, with muscle spasm, etc. Then they get P to A passive joint mobilizations directed at the zygopophyseal joints like the manual mobilization technique that I showed previously in the two studies in the introduction. This was done three times for 30 seconds each visit, three times a week for 10 weeks to, eat, to the dysfunctional joints in the mid to upper cervical spine determined by the therapist. Also, a myofascial release technique to the suboccipital tissues. Myofascial release can help mobilize the tissue, reduce pain, inflammation, muscle spasm. And then each subject got a functional exercise protocol to train the deep neck uh, flexors, also scapular retraining exercises, postural education exercises, and low load cervical flexion and extension exercises. These were done three times a week, three sets, 12 repetitions every time they came in. Okay, this is our functional exercise protocol that these subjects went through. Now this is a lot of intervention that they're getting each time. However, each one of these has some evidence to improve a, neck pain, B, increased range of motion, and C, cervicogenic dizziness, right? So what we're doing is we're looking at a known multimodal interve intervention strategy like would happen in a typical chiropractic or physical therapy setting. Then what we do is we add the dental on top of that in the experimental group. Now, you might go, well, you know, two things. Oh, well, adding the dental is going to be the straw that, you know, breaks the camel's back, so to speak. It's going to be the extra thing that gets the patients over the hump. You know what? That's not true, right? Doing one more thing isn't going to, you know, make this all, you know, improved in the DHI. And then you might go, well, you have no placebo in the uh, control group because they didn't uh, have an extra 20 minutes of intervention of laying on something on their back like we do with the dental. Well, maybe you should read the paper. There's some of you out there that, that actually need to read these things and identify what we did in the paper. We actually have a pseudo placebo dental going on in this study. The subjects laid down for an extra 15 to 20 minutes just like the dental group in the control group. They just didn't get the dental under their neck. So we actually have the same time of intervention going on in this population of interest. Very important part of this project, okay? So we can identify, is the dental really doing something, right? We don't have a group that only got, you know, laying down on their back as a placebo, but that's not what we're investigating. So the dental group gets the actual dental starting at three minutes, working their way up to 20 minutes, okay? Each session, three times a week for 10 weeks. The non-dental group, the control group, they get a placebo laying down 
uh, on their back to relax for the same amount of time, three times a week for 10 weeks. And just showing you some of the pictures of the things that uh, were done. And then crazy dizzy guy just to show you what we're studying. Uh, these were at home things that we taught people how to do, uh, you know, sitting with a proper uh, support in the low back and then scapular retraction and keep, keep your head back. These are things that the population did at home. All right, so the cervical dental roll. We've got small, we've got medium, or excuse me, we've got large, we've got medium, and small. I said that backwards, sorry. It helps to read and not just, you know, regurgitate. Uh, a patient that lies on their back and we take an x-ray, you'll notice the apex of the cervical curve is right here. Where does the reversal become most prominent? It's right here. Well, that's where we want to put the peak of the dental This part goes towards the shoulders. This goes at the apex of the abnormal cervical curve. So here's the same person lying on the dental shadow. You can see when we took the x-ray, or you can see the shadow of the dental here, and the apex of the dental is right where it's supposed to be. Now, when I launched the, these videos out on YouTube and on the CBP uh, public social media pages. Sometimes patients get really upset at me because they can't just go buy the dental roll like on Amazon or to, uh, go to Walmart or wherever. The reality of it is we're not gonna do that. This is called healthcare. The first rule of healthcare is do no harm. There's no way that myself or my colleagues that have developed the dental roll there's no way we're just going to say, oh, hey, patient X, go ahead and buy it. Even though you don't even know what your neck x-ray looks like, you have no idea if this thing is right for you. You don't know if you're placing it wrong. You don't know if you have some kind of other issue going on. So we're not going to just say, hey, patient, you can go buy this. Unfortunately and fortunately, you have to go to a licensed healthcare provider to be able to be prescribed the cervical dental. It is not for everybody. And I've taken a little bit of heat recently on social media for that, but so be it. I can take it, keep the heat coming. You know, I'm not going to do that personally. I'm not going to say, hey, you know, patient X, I don't even know what your condition, but yeah, the dental is going to work for you. No way, not doing it. So hopefully you appreciate that. This needs to be prescribed, okay? So 36 subjects that got the dental most subjects, 30 of them, get it in the lower neck. So 80% of the population uses the dental in the lower neck. And we do have to watch out for how much upper cervical tilt the person gets. Maybe they need that, maybe they don't. Only an x-ray and analysis of the person's spine will determine that. So this shows a lot of upper cervical extension, not every case gets that. So low neck placement in most people, mid neck placement in 20% of our population, nobody got it in the upper neck. Outcome measurements, x-ray measurements of head translation and curve, and then the big one, the DHI, and then severity of dizziness on a visual analog scale, cervical pain on a numerical rating scale, and then we're gonna look at cervical cephalic kinesthetic sense of repositioning. How accurate could a, a person reposition their head in space? And I, I forgot to put that one in uh, when I was putting this little presentation together. But we do have an assessment using the CROM, cervical range of motion device, on how accurate a person can reposition a midline uh, point left and right uh, of their head and neck, which is very important, right? Part of cervicogenic dizziness, the theory is their joint ligaments, the receptors in there, the ligaments and the receptors, the nerves are damaged and you don't understand where your head and neck are in space. Like I should be able to close my eyes and turn my head this far every time and I should be accurate when I do that. People with cervicogenic dizziness, their joints and ligaments are damaged and they're not getting proper feedback to the brain and, and the inner ear and the whole system being tied together in the brain and it throws them out of balance. So a cervicogenic dizziness person, they close their eyes and they go here one time and they go here another time, right? So they, they have an abnormal ability to repeat a position of the head and neck in space. This is part of the problem, right? Well, the actual, the actual problem is from the ligaments and the joint uh, uh, nerve receptors in there that control position sense of, of the head and neck, okay? Hopefully I did okay explaining that in a lay term. Uh, neck pain outcomes. Here's the kicker, at 10 weeks, 
Both groups are better. Both the experimental and the control groups are better. However, there's no differences between these primary measurements in our two populations. Both groups, their neck pain is better. Both group, the DHI is better, and we'll see how much. Both groups, the pain, or excuse me, the uh, visual analog scores for the frequency and severity of dizziness are better, okay? This right here, at first you look at it and go, wow, there's no difference in the Denerol group in these primary patient-driven outcomes. Their neck pain and their dizziness in both groups are improved, no statistically significant differences. You know, at first, you know, personally I can tell you as an author, and I, I believe in cervical curve rehabilitation, at first I looked at this and I go, wow, that's a bummer. Holy cow, the, the Denerol didn't really do anything at 10 weeks immediately after 30 visits of care. There's no difference with or without the Denerol. Both groups are better, but there's no difference in the Denerol group. There are differences though in the head translation and the cervical curve. The Denerol group got significant, statistically significant improvements in the cervical curve and the head posture. However, there's no differences in the dizziness between the two groups. Okay, so we look at this, we go, well, told you the Denerol can improve the cervical curve and we find it again and it improves the head posture compared to not doing the Denerol. However, we don't see that it improved the dizziness, at least yet, okay? So now we stop care, 30 visits, both groups are improved, let's monitor them over time, over the one year. Here's what we find. Now there are statistically significant differences between both groups for all the variables, indicating the Denerol group actually gets better or stays improved at one year follow-up, but the control group starts regressing back to baseline values. They slowly start to get worse again, where the Denerol group, we didn't see that. So now there's statistically significant differences that we can identify between the two groups, such that the group that got the cervical curve correction and the head posture correction with the Denerol, they're actually way better. Let's see how much better. Number one, anterior head translation. This is the Denerol group. E 3.5 centimeters down to 0.9. That's a large change. That's a 26 millimeter change in the Denerol group. Let's look at the control group that just got the standard exercises, the PT, etc. What do they get? Nothing. No improvement in head posture. No improvement. Doing all those exercises for the neck didn't seem to make a change. Now some of you, if you're a therapist out there, you're gonna go, I don't believe that. Well, that's why you do a randomized trial. Your belief has nothing to do with this data. What this shows is all those exercises didn't change the anterior head translation. That's what it shows. In contrast, the Denerol changed the anterior head translation 26 millimeters. And by the way, we're using true x-ray analysis. We're not doing a visual assessment that might be influenced by positioning of the upper thoracic spine, et cetera. One year follow-up data. Denerol group still maintains most of the correction. They lose five millimeters, so they're down to a 21 millimeter improvement. And look at the control group. The control group actually is now three millimeters worse. They go from 3.2 to 3.5. It's not a huge difference, but there's you know, in terms of where they started to where they are, but there is a big difference between the groups. Now look at the cervical curve. 7.5 in the Denerol group to 21. That's a 14 degree change in the cervical curve. It's maintained at long-term follow-up. We got 20.9, that's maintained at long-term follow-up. 7.2 to 6.7, no change in the cervical curve in the non-Denerol group. All the exercises and joint work, all that stuff, didn't change the cervical curve. It's not muscle spasm that is altering the cervical curve. If it was, then all those things in the control group would have improved muscle spasm that would have changed the cervical curve, but we don't see that. 7.2 in the curve, 6.7 to 6.2. No change without the Denerol of interest. Now here's the important part. I'm gonna skip the VAS dizziness. You can just quickly look at this. I'll leave it up there long enough. This is the one I wanna focus on, the DHI. This is our primary outcome tool. We wanna to see at least an 11 point change on the DHI 
to find minimally clinically important differences, at least an 11 point change. We also want to see that within the group and between the groups. Here's what we get. 47 to 23 in the Deneral group, that's a 50% change. 49 to 24 in the non dental group, that's a 50% change. Both groups are statistically improved by approximately 50%. Both groups achieve at 10 weeks minimally clinically important differences. Happy day. Problem is no difference between the two groups. So the dental doesn't appear to do anything different at 10 weeks. However, healing may take time. Body tissues take time to adapt to new positions and new things that are happening. Your body just doesn't heal overnight. Things are slow in the body, collagen turnover, etc. Certain types of collagen connective tissues can have a half-life of three to six months or more. So you look at this and you go, wow, maybe it takes time for the body to tolerate a cervical curve. Maybe, we don't know. Let's see what happens one year later. Look at the DHI and the dental group, 6.9, 6.9. It's dropped way down, way down. Not only did they you know, maintain the improvement, they got way better. It's 6.9, the DHI. Look at the non dental group, it goes from 24 to 39. It's jumped back up. It's still improved compared to when they started. However, it's not at the minimally clinically important difference. If you look at 49 to 39, that hasn't reached what we call the MCID cut point. But the dental group certainly has. They're, they started at 47, they're down to 6.9. And now look at the differences between the groups. Wow, this is a good thing. Do these people still have a little dizziness in the dental group? Yeah, but it's way better. It's considered mild. It's not moderate. And you look at all their scores, there are strong differences between the dental group and the non dental group that we isolated or find, found out at the one year follow up. That's where the big differences occur. It looks like rehabilitation of the cervical curve and head posture leads to long-term benefits in cervicogenic dizziness, chronic pain, and repositioning using the CROM, the, the uh, cervical cephalic positioning uh, sense. Okay, now here's the deal. This is the first randomized trial to show this. It's got proper power analysis. Does it need to be followed up with future trials? Absolutely. But man, does this now suggest that there appears to be a link in a subgroup of people that have loss of their cervical curve and head translation and cervicogenic dizziness outcome measures? Yes, it does in my opinion. And in the author's opinion that we, when we wrote this paper, that's what we said. We said, you know what? This is something that appears to have merit. The one year follow-up data is really good. It's very impressive. And this needs to be tried on people that have chronic cervicogenic dizziness. I mean, what else are you gonna do? You're gonna do standard things, you're gonna take medications, etc. Let's start rehabilitating the cervical curve in this subgroup and see what happens. This is the first randomized trial to show this. So just showing you a couple examples. In the dental group, here's before, 10 weeks after treatment, and then the one year follow-up. Before, 10 weeks after treatment, and then one year follow-up. Conclusions. The addition of the dental cervical extension traction device to a multimodal program appears to positively affect dizziness management outcomes at long-term follow-up. We speculate, excuse me, we speculate this improved dizziness at long-term follow-up is due to the improvement in the cervical curve and anterior head translation distance. Those two things drive joint kinematics. When you lose your cervical curve and your head goes forward, your joints work differently, mechanically. There are differences in the way those joints function under load as compared to somebody that has a good cervical curve and normal head posture. You can just alter your head posture and go through movement and do it for yourself. It's actually well known in the kinematics and biomechanics literature that the alignment of the, the spine in the neutral position drives dynamic kinematic movements. There's several trials out there. We believe that that is one of the mechanisms behind this improvement in the dental group for cervicogenic dizziness. Conversely, we believe that when you don't correct this, that's what drives the dizziness and the problems to continue to develop over, over time or get worse again. 
I think you should read the full text. There's several things that I left out, obviously. Uh, if you want to read it, uh, you can go to the journal website and download it. When the final uh, edited version comes out online, uh, I believe the journal will charge you for that. Uh, so you might want to get the pre-press uh, accepted version. But you should also download and get the, uh, the actual you know, printed uh, copy edited typeset version too. support the journal. This is a great journal out of Europe. It's one of the top physical medicine rehab journals in the world. And I, I think that we should support that journal. Uh, we are very, very honored and humbled to have had our paper accepted in such a prestigious journal. It's a lot of work to go through review process and sometimes uh, your papers don't get accepted. But in this case, uh, the European Journal of Physical uh, Rehabilitation and Medicine decided our project was uh, worth publishing. And by the way, this is the first time our group's ever been in this journal and we're just, like I said, extremely humbled and honored. Uh, uh, so without uh, you know, further ado, going into that, I'll end this week's presentation. Hopefully you enjoyed this. If you're a patient out there with cervicogenic dizziness, maybe let's seek out a provider that will look at your cervical curve and head translation and try it. See what it does for you, right? It's better than you know, suffering with the condition. Let's try new things. Let's see if we can improve you. This randomized trial offers some hope for you. If you're a doctor out there or a provider, let's get you using techniques that rehabilitate the cervical curve, right? The dental is a simple tool. It's a start. There's other techniques and treatments out there as well. Let's consider doing this in these populations that need this, specifically the subgroup that has a true loss of cervical curve and forward head po uh, posture. Lastly, uh, hopefully you'll consider supporting chiropractic biophysics nonprofit research. Uh, we are no a true nonprofit organization. Uh, we depend on research dollars from within the chiropractic profession and then without outside the chiropractic profession by other philanthropists that might want to support this type of work that we do. And then uh, lastly, what I'd like to do is again, just thank my colleagues at Cairo University, uh, Professor Ibrahim and uh, Professor uh, Diab. Uh, uh, you're just amazing. It's a, an honor to work with you. I'm, I'm extremely, extremely happy about the uh, projects that we've been doing and about the future projects that we have underway. So until uh, uh, next time, I'm Dr. Dean Harrison. Enjoy your week.